Are you looking for an open-minded perspective? A different view or a different take? Well, this is Lost in the Groove, society and culture podcast, donor culture, and deep dive. See here, we're all about the experience, all about the journey, and getting into the groove. Hey everybody, and welcome to Lost in the Groove. Today, we have an interview with an incredible person that has written a book all about America, a crisis, and in need, in need of being able to realize we need help. We all need help. And um, we have today Phyllis um, here to tell us about her work that she's been doing for 30 plus years and kind of her career in education, what she's learned for us away. So without further reduction, Phyllis, why don't you uh, introduce everybody? Thank um, you. Thank you so much. Yeah. My name is Phyllis Levitt and I have been a psychotherapist for over 30 years and done quite a bit of therapy myself. And um, over the time uh, that I have spent working with so many people in so many uh, painful relationships or um, feeling blocked at their creativity or having difficulty in friendship and work environments. Um, people who have suffered enormously from early childhood trauma and family trauma and uh, social trauma, um, racial trauma, you name it, it 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 all comes through a therapist's door and we just see a whole gamut of what is inside people that doesn't always show on the outside. Um, and so out of all of that experience, it really came to me very, very clearly. And a lot of my experience, let me say, because I believe and because of what I see, that a lot of abuse is um, epidemic in our country on an individual level, on a family level. There's a lot of sexual violence, a lot of physical violence, a lot of neglect, a lot of addiction, depression, high levels of anxiety, and poor bonding that um, that is that I, I see as epidemic in our society. And it's average people like you and me who really behind closed doors have often suffered tremendous um, loss, betrayal, abandonment, and hurt in their personal relationships. And we carry that into the rest of our lives in some ways, um, whether it's how we, you know, how we cope, what we believe about other people, what we've come to expect about, you know, out of life, what life has yeah. to offer, what it doesn't have to offer. Um, and so, you know, what I began to see, and this is really where the idea for my book was born, was that the dynamics that operate in families where there's abuse and neglect are very identifiable. See that the same dynamics are happening on a national level. Greatest power institutions and institutions of government, certainly not, not all, but there's repression and domination of people that looks very much like what you see in abusive families with the same long lasting, very deleterious effects on millions of people, the way an individual abuser can have very long lasting and deleterious effects on the small number of people that he or she can control. And so I really wanted to write about that. I wanted to inform our country and and let people know that this is what's happening on a psychological level. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of like the bad news. The bad news is that there's really a lot of abusive dynamics happening on a socially acceptable, which is that's part of the alarm level. Um, but also the good news and the good news um, and the, and the whole reason for writing my book is not to dwell on the bad news, but to inform people sort of like if you go to the doctor, you want the doctor to tell you what's wrong because they can't help you heal if they don't know exactly what's wrong. 
And so part of the job of psychotherapy is to assess what isn't working, whether it's in the internal structure of a person's psyche or in the dynamics of their family and relationships that are not working. And then on the basis of that, formulate a way to help. So the whole point is, can we use all the gifts of healing and helping people recover from even the most terrible things that have happened to them at the hands of other people? Can we use all the gifts of psychotherapy um, to help heal ourselves as a nation? And I believe we can. And I believe the more people are informed about what we can actually do in the face of some of the terrible things that are happening and advocate for doing them, um, that, the, that the possibility of pulling ourselves back from such a, a place of divisiveness and violence and hatred and discrimination and um, such a gap between the rich and the poor, for instance, um, and still the continuing inequality that women and minorities suffer to a great extent, that we have the capacity to heal that if we have the information we need and we have the will to do it. And um, so I'll just say a little bit more about the will to do it. And then please jump in and ask me anything that you would like to ask. Um one of the things that's so interesting about, there's so many things that are interesting about psychotherapy and psychology that I think the average person doesn't really know unless you've been exposed to it. Right. And that is that psychology and, and psychotherapy therapy are not partisan. It's the, it, the, the goal of psychotherapy is not to decide who's right and who's wrong or who's better or who's worse or who's moral or who's immoral. The goal of psychotherapy is actually to repair our human relations. It's to bring us back into love and belonging and safety and cooperation. And one of the big ones, and this is one of the reasons why I'm so invested in spreading this message on a national level, um, it's invested in nonviolent conflict resolution because that's one of the keys to our mental health, that we learn the skills and we have the capacity and the drive to settle our differences. And sometimes they're great. And sometimes the anger is intense, but to settle right. those differences in a nonviolent, yeah. constructive way that it that at the very least leads to a truce and at the very most leads to actual repair and reconnection with one another. And the yeah. main motivator, yeah, go ahead. Jump in, it, please. It, the interesting thing about uh, when, especially when you bring up the the conversation about therapy, yeah, is you bring up this idea of somebody else telling you, giving you an education of what you should and shouldn't do in a situation, whatever that situation may be. You know, a breakup, a relationship crisis, mother or father issues. Uh, issues with religious practices, such as going to church or synagogue. And when you become an adult, you have all of these traumas that you have all packed and you hold on your shoulders. And right. the, the issue is, is not therapy. The issue is the realization of we have a world today that is heavily adv advanced to the point that you can have a, a, anything at your fingertips. You can have any type of book that you want, you can listen to pretty much any type of video or movie or film. So you have to ask yourself, if everybody is being fed all of this information and everybody has all of this surrounding them constantly, 365 days a year, when do people have even the time to sit down and relax, be able to breathe from all of it? Yeah. So are, um, let me just clarify your question. So are you asking what the world of psychology would have to offer in terms of bringing us back into more relationality with one another in general? Well, yeah, because think about the way that connection even works now. Most right. people today, you can connect globally through the internet. Right. For example, like what we're doing right now. Right. Right. Uh, Going back to the point of human connection, physically being there with people is mm -hmm. so vital. 
because right. we are social creatures. That's how we evolve from tadpoles. That's right. Well, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of pieces to your question. And so if I get off track, bring me back. OK, sure. Um, because there's a lot of angles to look at what you're talking about. One of one of the angles is that human beings have amazing intelligence and it seems to be growing on a certain level. Our technological expertise, our ability to heal our bodies, you know, transplant an organ, um, make prosthetic limbs and stem cell. Yeah. All of that. We, we have enormous brain capacity to devise new technologies, think new thoughts, have new perspectives. And um, but along with that, we also have destructive impulses and creative impulses. We have relational impulses and we have impulses to dominate and um, natural instincts. Right. And so we alone probably of any living creature that I'm aware of actually are at a place in our evolution where we have to make some choices about how we use our intelligence because some of the ways that we're using our intelligence could actually end up causing the human race and life as we know it to go extinct. And that would be with some of the ways that we're polluting our environment and destroying our environment. And the way that people are being treated in the Congos, for example. A hundred percent. And the weaponry that we've created that can kill millions of people at a time. And so we're really at a place in our own evolution where we have to decide how to use the intelligence that we have. And there may be things we're capable of doing, like making nuclear weapons, that if we were mentally healthy, we wouldn't do. And by mentally healthy, what I mean is, what I call mental health is and, and, and I know that mental health is a big discussion these days. It is, yeah. I want to take it out of the realm of the mentally ill are, you know, people in the back ward of an asylum or muttering on the street to themselves. Certainly those people need a lot of help and they have a mental illness. However, what I would call mentally unhealthy today, well, let me say what I think mental health is, and then we can look at the negative. Um what creates mental health and well-being are being in an environment, a social environment, a family environment that is loving and caring, that is essentially cooperative and supportive of one's individuality while holding some balance between the, what the, you know, the, the impulses of the individual and the good of the whole. So that there's a balance between expressing our own needs and wants, right. but also managing that within the context of what creates survival and thrival for everyone. But Some also, the, yeah, but, go ahead. But also think about the non-biological families. For example, for myself, right. being that I, I come from the gay community, I was came from a religious community and I left. I had to create my own family yes. and the friends that I have, the people that I've made connections with the balances. See, this is important. And you bring this up and this is this is thing I've, I've said so many times, balance boundaries, right. That's creating right. a line and foundation. The thing about relationships is this, if there is shit from the beginning, if there is issues and excuse me, fuckery, you know what you're getting yourself into as humans were smart enough creatures that if you are in presence of another person, you should know the balance and you should know the boundaries that lay at hand. Because if you don't know that, that's not a good situation you want to be in with the person. Right. Well, what I would say, I mean, what you bring up is really, really important. And it sounds like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds right. like you made it out of some of the difficulties of your own childhood and created a family that is healthy around yourself, that supports you, that loves you, that cares for you, and that honors your self-expression and and in which you have found, to, to whatever degree, some of that balance between the good of the individual and the welfare of the whole. 
And you're very fortunate. Um, and not everyone finds that. And what I what I see, and that of course would be the goal that, or one of the goals that if you don't have that in your family of origin or with the community that raised you, that you will develop and have the good fortune to find that good family and that healthy environment in another place. And it's, part of what I'm saying is that yeah. I don't think our as a whole is providing that for people or even encouraging that for many people, maybe just for a very few. Um, and a well, good because if doesn't... you if you look at mental health in this country, it's not it's sick care because it's not providing any mental benefit of staying healthy, staying, you know, physically social. It, it's promoting this idea of staying solidary staying isolated it's the opposite of what human beings should be doing you're 100 percent right and i think and again i think there's many reasons for that and one of them one of the big ones and this is certainly one of the dynamics in an abusive family that you see happening on a national and on larger the level of larger institutions or governing um, agencies is that um when people are allowed to healthfully join together and collaborate, they're more of a threat to those who want to maintain power. And an abuser wants to maintain power and control. Otherwise, they can't do whatever it is they're trying to do or get from other people. And so there's there's a there's a benefit to an abusive system to keep people from banding together and forming healthy relationship in a way that would support them having an appropriate voice and an appropriate power in the whole. And this is, this is one of the many dynamics that I talk about in my book, because we need to know that that's what's happening to us. Um, and so, so you're absolutely right about that. And we're wired to connect. We're wired to love and be loved. And so to the extent that people are suffering in their homes and suffering socially and suffering from repressive or discriminatory or violent policies on a larger level, they often, and, and I see this because this is one of the reasons why people come to therapy, because they find themselves unable to make the kind of choices that you're talking about you've been able to make. Either they're not available or they really don't know how to do it because that wiring has never been hooked up inside them. Well, it takes it, it takes time for that to connect. And the thing is, some of us have been more fortunate in other avenues. So, right. for example, if you want to use me, I grew up in a home. My father was an immigrant. Mm -hmm. My father worked around other people that were from the Caribbean islands, such as Jamaica, Haiti, mm -hmm. so, you, you know, Central America, such as Mexico, Nicaragua, Guatemala. So I was I was raised around a mixture of different types of people all wow. pretty much all the time. So. Wow. My understanding of cultural diversity and being able of acceptance seems rational to me. But right. what you're saying is to a lot of people, there's still this idea of segregation, of this, this fear, this. I'm like, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go have some really good tamales. So you do what you got to do and I'm going to have yeah. some fun. <laughs> That's really funny um, because that's what actually I'm having for dinner tonight. Love tomatoes. But, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you're, you are very fortunate and certainly many people are. There are also millions of wonderful, caring, generous, kind people in America who serve others, you know, are good neighbors, are wonderful teachers or doctors or professionals, or just, you know, a pleasant person waiting on you in a restaurant. There are millions of wonderful people in this country, and that is not to be denied. However, they're not always in the news. Um, they're not generally what we're fed as the role models of where we would love our young people to fashion themselves on. Um, and they're often not in positions of high power in our country. No. So 
there's a big gap between and so so one of the things I often say when I'm talking about my book is that one of the things that psychology addresses and that I'm trying to make really like um, front and center of our awareness is that most people I would say I would I don't know anyone who doesn't but but most people want love they want connection. They want a feeling of belonging. They want to feel like they're valued for their gifts. They want to feel like there's a meaning and purpose to their lives that is respected by others. And they want to feel like if there's a problem, that they're safe to work it out, um, that they're not going to be killed for having a difference of opinion. You know, we that's what we want. And we suffer psychologically and mentally and emotionally to the degree that we don't have those things. Th that, that is basic human psychology. We need to connect. We need to cooperate. We need to feel valuable by other human beings. And we need physical, you know, physical connection with other human beings. We need loving touch, not assaultive touch or sexually violating touch um, or, you know, or repulsion by other people because of the way we look or the way we dress. Yeah. That's the thing is also we're, yeah. come on. I mean like the hottest topics, for example, like misgendering and these are things that come down to just central norms of where I'm an accepting person. When you're around other people, you want to be inclusive and you want to be understanding. And, but at the same time, there needs to be understanding that we're humans we make mistakes, right. not perfect. Absolutely. We're allowed to ask questions. A person is allowed to ask you a question. It may be an inappropriate question, right? But right. you're you're still allowed to ask a question. Yeah. Um, I don't and know. You're also allowed to make a mistake. We are human, and we do make mistakes. Yeah. And we have a society that really believes still in like crime and punishment rather than looking at where a person might be coming from and what help they actually need to make better decisions in their life. And, you know, I am a hundred percent for restorative justice. Um, and one of the things that I looked up, you know, when I was writing my book is that the incidence of a history of abuse in our incarcerated population is way higher way higher than the average population. So you're talking about people anywhere else, a Any, double whammy than anywhere. By the way, this is, this is true. Yeah. You can go online right now and check this. We have yes. the highest incarceration rate than any other country. Yeah, I know in the world and black people are incarcerated at six times the rate of white people for this shit um, for can for cannabis. Still yeah. to this day in this country, in 2023. I know. And some of that, and this is one topic that we haven't talked about, um, but it's part of the power over dynamic and keeping abusive policies in place, is that it's profitable. And it's horrifyingly profitable. The prison system that we have is horrifyingly profitable for the people who run prisons and the industries that get cheap or free labor from prison populations. And I don't even know if the average person knows that. I didn't know any of those statistics until I began to look them up. Oh, and, I knew that. Yeah. And so we have... You know, we do things to other human beings, and this is what I was going to say before, that the gap between what we want for ourselves and how each one of us wants to be treated by the people around us and society at large, and what we allow and condone and legislate be done to other people is a chasm. There, The gap, is, and that is a sign of mental illness in our country. It kind of this is something that I've, I've thought about for a while. This country was formed by immigrants. OK, exactly. all it's different kinds of immigrants. Now, you have to understand something. If you look at American history, which is not that long, it's only about 200 odd years. Yeah. It has all been war, chaos, disease, trauma. I mean, the list goes on. This country was basically built on trauma. It was yeah. a 
traumatized country all the way through. So we're in this debacle because somebody 200 years ago started it. So you could blame that. You could blame the past. That's what people do. You always blame the past or like what you're promoting is you fix the future. We're here now. Mm -hmm. We're not 200 years in the past. No, but you know, I think you bring up an important point that I would say is a very, I mean, there's several important points that you just brought up from a psychological perspective. One of them, one of them is that we, we are a country of immigrants and the only people who weren't the immigrants were the native Americans who we did our best to slaughter and transform into, you know, take their ways and their education away from them and took their children away from them. Um, and have basically looked at them as inferior human beings to a great extent all this time. So, but but the important thing about the the fact that we're immigrants is two things. One of them is that we brought trauma. Many many people, not all people, but many of the people that came to America were fleeing imprisonment. They were fleeing persecution. They were fleeing wars. They were fleeing poverty. They were fleeing religious persecution. And they brought those traumas with them and none of them were healed. We didn't have the tools to heal those traumas. Then we didn't even talk about trauma in. It wasn't even a conversation. It wasn't a conversation. Psychology wasn't a conversation. People were just doing whatever they had learned to survive. And the other, so the, so that's one piece is that we, our history is built on un healed trauma and unhealed trauma perpetuates itself in a number of ways. And that's part of what has happened in the United States and really all over the world. But if we're talking about the United States, the other important part of being survivors of trauma that many, many of the immigrants that came to America were, is that we are also inflictors of trauma. We killed native American people. We did our best to destroy them. We enslaved black people. And and we still persecute minorities. We we still do not treat women as equals. We've never passed the equal rights amendment that women can are entitled to equal pay for equal work. Um, and the list goes on. And so we have to look not only at the traumas we've endured as a country, as a populace, but the traumas that we have inflicted on other people that we have um, perpetuated. And that's part of what the beauty of psychotherapy and psychology is, is that it provides a safe place to look at both of those things. And, you know, it's always harder to look at what you did that wasn't so great than what somebody else did to you that wasn't so great. You know, it's easier to talk about what happened to us sometimes, and sometimes even that's very painful, but it's harder to take responsibility for the things that we've done that weren't good toward other people. And so when I say America in therapy, that's part of what I'm talking about is like, what if we could make it safe to actually take responsibility for the harm that we have inflicted and that we still inflict without saying we're horrible people or they did this and they did that, but that we come to the table to actually work it through, to own all of our truths. And, you know, the the role model, however, you know, not perfect or long lasting it might have been, but which was an amazing start was truth and reconciliation in South Africa, um, where um, the victims of apartheid and the perpetrators of apartheid, some of them who were willing, sat down and listened to each other and owned the truth of what had happened. And this was an amazing model. Was it perfect? No, because we don't know perfect yet. See, but- see that's a, that's the the cherry on the top because a lot of conflicts a lot of wars a lot of situations could have been solved by a conversation of both sides just coming to a table the 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 egotistic side of some human beings the the narcissism the the level of i will do whatever i can do to survive 
it's astonishing. It it yes. in, incorporates millions of of lives along with that. That's right. So this again, you bring up excellent points, and I really want to thank you. It's a it's wonderful to have this conversation with you because you're tuned in to a lot of what it we're suffering from, and you're tuned into a lot of the questions that a lot of of average Americans have and that do not have easy access to answers. And I'm not saying that I have all the answers because nobody does, but I want to share the things that I've learned that I think are really helpful and valuable. Of course. And in, in response to what you're saying, because it's such an important point. Um, and I, and again, I go into this in quite a bit of detail in my book, because this is one of the things that I learned so much about as a therapist over many years is that when abuse and neglect go unaddressed when no one is rescued and they don't get any help or treatment for what they have suffered. Um, yes. Let me just preface this by saying there are miracle people who make it out of there and they go on to live amazing lives and they often help other people. And they are just the most, there are heroes and our heroines, you know, they, they rose from the ashes and they are inspiring and thank God that there's that kind of resilience, resiliency in the human spirit. But I'm here to say that the vast majority of people don't just rise from the ashes without help. And when there's no rescue and no treatment for trauma um, and cruelty at the hands of other people, there are two very common outcomes. And I see them escalating in our country in general. And actually, I think they're escalating around the world. But I talk about America because I live here and this is the country I'm familiar with. And the two most common outcomes are passivity, learned helplessness. If you've been overpowered by someone who hurts your body or inflicts great mental torture on you or sexually violates you or ostracizes you or withholds the basic necessities of life from you, if you are continually overpowered by someone like that, you may internalize, and many people do, that it's useless to resist, that nothing I do is going to produce any help for me. And so people often become really, really believe they are helpless and they become passive and powerless and they are very easily controlled by dominating others. So that's one half of the spectrum. The other half of the spectrum of outcomes when abuse is not treated or stopped very often is what is called identification with the aggressor. And these are the people who will you know, are somehow bound and determined that they will never be the victim and they become aggressive themselves. They Their rage is turned outward. Both have rage. You cannot hurt another person without them feeling some anger somewhere. So it's like be, either between them being physically abusive or them being mentally abusive. Yeah, or both. Oh, wow. Or both. Oh, wow. And the danger, and this is what I see as such a danger for America, and this is why I feel like I want to sound such big alarms, is that those people who identify with the aggressor and become abusers on some continuum, maybe they're just mean to their kids, maybe they have road rage, maybe they're really nasty to all their employers, or maybe they run for office and they start to um, enact discriminatory, hateful policies toward the people that they can control. Um, the people who identify with the aggressor and the people who learn to be, well, let me just say one at a time because they overlap. People who tend to identify with the aggressor are at great risk for rallying around abusers. They're the kids on the playground who will support the bully who will egg the bully on from their own feelings of powerlessness. They will sort of vicariously experience the power of the bully and like leech. Yeah. And we see this in government. We see the people that have rallied around the most hurtful leaders um, and piece of people in positions of power and support them. Even when behind closed doors, it comes out that they don't actually support them, you know, um, 
And so this is frightening. This is a frightening outcome of unrestrained abuse. And people who are easily dominated and passive are easily dominated by hurtful, um, bullying type people in whatever level of family system they're involved in, whether it's their home or their community or their workplace or whatever. And and I've worked with, with a lot of that. Um, I will say, and this is also frightening, but I think most therapists would say this, that the majority of people who come to therapy are not the bully. Um, the, the majority of people who come to therapy are people who are really trying to find their power and their voice and an ability to protect themselves and or their children. Um, because a bully who gets power from hurting other people and dominating other people is less likely to want change. It's beneath them. They Because for them to go to a therapist, have somebody tell them they should be, what should that, that, that they should change? How dare you? How dare you tell me to change? Mm-hmm. That type of passive aggressive attitude. The, the, the thing is, is that about humans, now everything's in the open. That's so, right. And that's a good news. That's the good news. That actually. is the good it's news. Bad. It's the good news and the bad news. You know, yeah, It's the bad yeah. news for the, the person that's doing the act. It's the good news for us because we know you're an asshole. Yeah. Well, the good news is that a lot of what's been happening behind closed right. doors until recently is now coming to light. And that is the good news. And and one of the things that I that I have become aware of that I want to share that I also think is the good news. You know, people all, often ask me, why do you think there's more hatred and more violence and more mass shootings and more, you know, why is discrimination against black people on the rise when, you know, we went through all of the, you know, the the segregation issues and the integration issues. And, you know, when we looked like we were on the road to more civil equality. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important to know is that while it looks like part of, part of the reason why it looks that way, I think human beings have always been this way to some extent is that we have with technology and the internet, um, you know, you know, you can hear about something that happened on the other side of the world. You know, the social pressures to look and be and do a certain way are enormous. And if those influences are abusive influences, there's pressure on young people to follow those role models and look cool by being tough or whatever that pressure is. Um, but the good news is what I wanted to get to. The good news is, is that we are also, I think, learning to be more humane. These things might have been accepted, you know, in a in a country of warlords where some people just have power and other people are forced to submit, and you're lucky if you got to stay alive and had food. Um, we weren't looking at it from from whether it was right or wrong or humane or not. And there's a huge movement toward humanism that's happening, that we're reflecting on these abusive behaviors and saying, this is not okay. This is not the way human beings are supposed to treat one another. This is not healthy. And this is actually going to cause, it could cause the demise of the human race. So the good news is, is that we do actually have a growing psychological awareness and impulse toward psychological health that is reflecting on what's happening and bringing it to light. Just like in, in good therapy, you go down into you know your own life and you look at the formative influences and you reflect on, wow, this is what my parents did. And this part of it really was hurtful. And that part of it was helpful. Or do you know what I'm saying? And as a country, we need to look at our own psychological development the same way with that humanistic approach, which is we're trying to heal, not hurt. We're, not, we're trying to heal the pain. The, the I issue, say, go ahead, go ahead. The, the issue is, is that so many people want to point the finger. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's crazy to think that there is a race crisis with black people. There's race crisis with Latin people. There's race crisis with white people. There's right? race crisis with everybody. There's race crisis with every single gender. There, 
there, there's prices every the, the the thing is is that to be able to have the conversation of stating the obvious of you as an individual have your rights you have an, as an individual have your rights and so on why are we why are we forcing these ideas and opinions such as the drug the the drug war okay first off that is absolute insanity i'm one of those people that believe i think drugs will all, all be legal it's none of the fuck it's none of the government's business to tell anybody what they should be doing first mm-hmm. off i'm a libertarian mm-hmm. and this is just how i think yeah. and when you run into this this situation of control and what you're allowed to have and what you're not it doesn't work you can't tell people what to do because what happens is is what ha- is happening now mm-hmm. it, it 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 never works it never has and never will well again you you point to each time you bring something up you point to one of the one of the dynamics that i talk about that belong to abusive families and abusers and one of them is that in order to stay in a position of power and control, abusers will target certain populations and and blame them. Abusers always blame their victims for the abuse. Those people are bad because they take drugs. Those people are bad because they have an alternative sexual preference. Those people are inferior because they're women or they're poor or they're disabled. or they're heavy, you know, whatever it is, there's an abuser finds a target population to bolster their position because part of the dynamic, as you know, is you turn people against each other. And that's how you stay in power. You incite your your followers or the people that have identified with your aggression to blame some target population for their ills. I I saw this video of a reporter interviewing a man who was right wing. I don't know what militia group he was belonged to, but this was previous to the last election. He was interviewing this man who was part of some militia and his wife was sitting on the ground next to him, holding an infant and, and a little toddler was on the standing or sitting next to her. And he was anti-Semitic and he was talking about how the Jews were the problem. And this is what he was being brainwashed to believe that all of his problems, personally, his economic and social problems were all because of the Jews. And his wife said, we just need another Holocaust. And it was horrifying to witness the levels of brainwashing that people have been subjected to, that they actually believe that some other race of people that they don't know and have never met. We have horns. Remember we have horns. Yeah. I I hid them for the podcast specifically. Okay. Well, I can see them anyway. (laughs) No. And, but this is what happens that, that it's either the Jews or black people or gay people or women or, you know, you know what it is. It's always some population that it, that is made to be the brunt of an abuser's abusive actions. And other people are brainwashed into believing that they are the problem. And we see from human history how devastating that can be, how inhumane and cruel the policies and practices that grow out of that. Because it's easy, it's easy to point the finger. That's right. And it's really hard to take personal responsibility. And yet, and this is where I say the good news is, you know, the the basic underlying principles of all good psychotherapy are make it safe to take responsibility, make it safe to reflect on yourself, actually promote reflecting on yourself. When I was in graduate school, I took a class in couples counseling. And a lot of the work I did was with couples and families, children, um, and individual adults. But if you went through the lens of current day psychology, 
you see everything through the lens of family therapy, even if you're only working with an individual, because you're looking at the conditioning that happened in the family and that happens in the present day family systems, even if it's your employee family or your you know employer family um, or your your church or your school. Right. Um, but I, I remember this one thing that the teacher in my couples therapy class said that has always stayed with me because I think it's one of the most valuable contributions of psychotherapy, and there are many. And what he said was that in all of his, he, his years of working with couples, the couples that did the best, the couples that came out of therapy um, with real repair of their relationship and renewed love and you know a gratifying and satisfying relationship were those couples where the individual partners were able to take the most responsibility for their contribution to the dysfunction of the relationship. Wow. And that was profound for me because I see that that's true. I see it true in my own marriage. I see it true in my relationship with my children. Um, and it's one of the hardest things for human beings to do. We seem to have been taught or were wired to project blame out onto other people. And abusers do that to the yeah. extent where they're willing to even kill. Um, it, and it's so, funny. It's funny, though. Well, the It's funny that you bring up the topic of Jews, because as a person, you know, I'm Jewish. And mm -hmm. it's so it's so bizarre because there is probably I don't know what's the number of us like 16 million. I don't know. Some small number like that. We make a very small percentage of the human population. OK. And the reality is a lot of us. We're not rich. Kind of poor. A lot of us. We work in mechanic shops, we're plumbers, we own businesses. It's just, it's so bananas when you have a person that didn't come from my culture, didn't grow up where I grew up with, you know, I actually am Jewish. You don't even know who I am. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, and we really actually don't know who anybody is. And Unless you talk to them and get to know them and learn exactly. to communicate with them. A hundred percent. And I'll share this other story. I've also shared this story many times, but I really love this story because I feel like it it really pinpoints something so helpful. Um, so there was a, a a man that I had met in, I, I used to live in Santa Fe before I moved to Taos, New Mexico. And there was a um, a man in who lived in Santa Fe named Craig Barnes, who was a, among many things. I think he wore many hats, but one of the things that he was was an international mediator. And I went to a talk that he gave and he also said something I have never forgotten because it's one of the principles of the best uh, psychotherapy that works when you are bringing people together to work out their issues. And what he said was that when he would meet with warring or you know co conflictual parties, who people who had been at war or who had, who were, you know, engaged in high levels of conflict, whatever they were, what he did when he got them into the same room with each other, the first thing that he did was have them share their pain, the children they had lost, the churches that had been burnt down, the homes that had been destroyed, um, the, you know, the lives that they had lost, the way of life that they had lost. And, and he just had them listen while the other side, the people on the other side of the conflict shared their pain and their loss and their grief um, and their rage and all of it. And once people heard their pain, they were, they, the empathy in the room began to grow because what they realized was their pain was the same. Their losses were the same. Their hurt was the same. Um, and their anger was the same. And that built the basis for working out whatever the conflict was, because there was a sense of empathy that began to grow. And 
That is what the best psychotherapy does. It has people deeply listen without reacting, just listening the best they can and taking in another person's point of view, another person's problem, another person's issue, another person's early wounding, um, all of it. And that is the basis for beginning to repair our human relations. It's the basis is empathy. And one of my yeah. dreams is that we have mediators in Congress who would actually direct the conversation between conflictual sides of any issue and teach them deep listening skills, teach them how to listen the way that they all want to be heard. The reality, be- the reality is the only way you can ever fix politics in this country is if you remove money. If you, remo- if you remove money from politics, which is impossible, if you remove politics, if you remove those two, you fix all of the issues. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a really important point because money is power in our country and power over other human beings is one of the basic ingredients for abusing human other human beings. The more power you have over another human being, the more you can do or not do what you like. Mm -hmm. And so absolutely. And you bring up another really important issue, again, that I, I think it's so helpful to look at through the lens of psychology and psychotherapy. And that is that we are suffering as a country from massive addiction. Addiction to wealth is one of our major addictions. Wealth, power, sex, um, acquisition, you know, the best technologies, whether they serve us or not. There's so much, you know, and these things are addictive and we know they're addictive. And and I think we have to look at some of this through the lens. And that's not the only way to look at the wealth gap issue, but it's an important one. Because to the extent that it's addictive, then those who are in positions to really acquire at other people's expense never have enough because that's the nature of an addiction. You want more. You want another fix. You want the next the next best thing. Somebody I can think of like today, be like David Cho, who's a famous artist out in LA. He's a great example of he's a very wealthy person. But the way he is, he has no problem like traveling coach, is no problem going in the middle of Africa and being with tribes and being mm-hmm. a part of the culture. Mm-hmm. Like he's a person that says, look, I got lots of money, but I'm also here to be a part of the experience. Yeah. And Beautiful. it is. And it's something so rare that you can find. Because of, like you said, like that margin, that gap that exists, which is just it's just a reality of how society has developed over thousands. And that's why we have to address our mental health, because these are all at their heart, mental health issues. Addiction at its heart is a mental health issue. Yeah. And and the resolution of addiction, the healing from addiction is a mental health issue. It's a mental health healing issue. It's very fundamentally a psychological issue. I used to volunteer, not volunteer, I was a paid um, associate at a um, dual diagnosis treatment center in Santa Fe for a while. And I did um, a certain form of therapy with some of the clients. And there's a reason why it's called dual diagnosis. It's part of the part of the problem is the addiction itself, the substance, and part of the problem is the underlying mental ill health that contributes to it. And when I, another thing that I wanted to share about that, and can you why elaborate I, on that more? Oh yeah, so so people were the, most of the people in this particular treatment program were there for there were a few there for eating disorders, but most of the addiction mm-hmm. was around drugs, drugs and alcohol. And um, so part of the treatment was, you know, education around drugs, 12 step groups, um, you know, learning to cope without using. Um, And, but often what would occur for people, and I think most often is that if you take the drugs away, there's a distress that they're, that they've been trying to medicate. 
And so you have to deal with the distress and that's an emotional issue and very often a psychotherapy issue. What they happened? Need they, you, like you can't just take away the drug. Right. They need also the therapy. Yeah, it's true. Cause, cause honestly, it's crazy to think some drugs, for example, like heroin, if you take a person off, they'll die. Yeah. You have to do it very carefully, very, yeah, very carefully. And to even today, I mean, I've heard of cases, um, for example, where they're using MDMA therapy for patients that are dealing with opiate addiction like heroin, and they're using psychotherapy, different types of therapies to get these people off. So right. your point is, and it's, I, I guess this is something that is now becoming part of the main practice is using a right. dual dual right. therapy. Oh, absolutely. It is main practice. And what it points to when mm -hmm. you look at the large uh, number of addicts and addiction issues in our country um, and the demand for drugs is that we're also a suffering population that is trying to numb itself out. And how can we take responsibility as the family of America for the pain that so many people are feeling? Because it isn't just coming from their family as of origin is coming from societal abuse and neglect. And what I, I wanted to return though, to just make another point that I think is really valuable when we're looking at the addictive nature, like you were talking about wealth as being a force of, of great pain and destruction in our country, because there's such an addiction to wealth, you know, way beyond what any one person needs to survive. Um, at the expense of many, many people barely being able to survive and many children growing up in homes um, of poverty and neglect and not having enough food or heat or education or medical services. Um, so what there was a book that I read when I was in graduate school about addiction. And one of the one of the key things that it said was that addiction, um, the, one of the main harms of addiction addiction is that a person's main relationship becomes with a substance or with wealth or with food or with gambling um, or, you know, or a drug. Um, and that means that their main relationship, their primary relationship is not with other people. It's with their fix. And in that in that psychology, in that mindset where I am focused on getting more of something that's not more love and connection and cooperation and um, affirmation and belonging with other people, when I'm focused on something that is not people-centered, I am less likely to care about other people. I had a friend a um, long time ago. I'll never forget this. He told me. He said, when you're an addict, he said, it's like a mother. Mm. He, said it, he said, it's a mother that cannot give its offspring milk and feed its children. That's exactly what I'm saying. Oh, my God. I'll never forget that. And you, you sparked that. And I was like, yep, it's so true, though. Right. Because, and, and the sad thing is that no matter how much money you have, no matter how much more food you eat or gains you get at the gambling table, it never replaces the basic need for our human connection. And it never will, and it never can. And so it's a bottomless pit. It really is a bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. And I, I had... Um, a client many, many years ago, such a poignant example of what we're talking about. N not a bad person at all, not a hurtful bone in their body, but this person had um, inherited great wealth and therefore really didn't have to do anything to survive and never did, never went to college, never got a job, um, just in, in was sort of obsessed with collecting this and collecting that and spending, you know, outrageous amounts of money collecting stuff that he then put in a storage shed because he had nothing to do with it. And he was the most unhappy, unfulfilled per person 
one of the most unhappy, unfulfilled people I've ever met. And it was tragic. It was absolutely tragic. He had no sense of self. Um, he had nothing. I mean, he had, had a family um, and he was fairly non-functional in his family. You know, um, he didn't role model anything for his children because he didn't have anything to role model. And, you know, that's, that's, that's one sort of extreme end, but very, very sad. It's like, yeah, so you had all this money and then what? But it's not fulfilling. It doesn't create relation. It doesn't create a good sense of self. Well, for example, like even today, people that show off expensive jewelry and Lamborghinis and Rolls Royce and all of these things. Look, I'm one of those people. I love expensive cars, too. Don't get me wrong. I would love to own a Porsche. It's <laughs> of one course. of my dreams. It's a beautiful car. But yeah. the, there's an underlying fact of why do you need to express this amount right. of wealth? Is it right. because that when you were growing up, you didn't have those things? Or is it maybe maybe there's a deeper layer under there? Right. Right. Because because a lot of the role models of success and esteem and valuing in our culture are centered around acquisition and showing that you made it, that you're successful on a monetary level, rather than, for instance, that you're a successful human being because people love you and you love them and you're caring and you're kind and your kids are growing up to be constructive lovely helping human beings in our culture you know i mean that is there don't get me wrong there isn't it's not that there's none of that in our culture but the pressure to be wealthy the pressure to have a lot of money and the yacht and the whatever um and to be famous in that way is is very unhealthy and yeah. but very influential and it's part of the whole addict thing. I think it's part of the whole addiction thing. You sometimes have to, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes you have to take an addiction and turn it into something else. Sometimes you can use it to be creative. I knew somebody that was addicted to pills for a very long time. And they fell in love with metal work. Mm. and they were tinkering and they were able to build all these things. And now they're able to build parts for cars. You know, you don't realize that's the thing sometimes about also feeling hopeless and feeling like you don't realize what you can do until you try. Thing is, all you, all you got to just tell yourself is just try it. Yeah. Like once. Yeah. So, you know what that makes me think of? Absolutely for sure. I think um, expressing our greatest creativity, whatever it is, whether it's like metal work or caring for animals or, you know, carpentry. Yeah. A garden, whatever it is, or it could be something massive, like you're an architect or an artist or a musician or whatever it is. But I like to imagine when you say that, a government, a society that invests in that, that that's where our resources go, that children, all children, rich or poor, you know, no matter where they live, north, south, east, west, wherever they live, urban, rural, are that we've invested in our schools and in our communities to provide all kinds of creative opportunities for our children and praise them and support them to find that kind of um, creative expression and connection to themselves before they feel empty and lost and alone and want to have drugs or. Yeah. I, I feel that because look, I, I'm not, I'm no person to talk about education, but I will say this as a kid that I have ADHD, I have dyslexia. I don't know if it's such a great idea to stick kids in a classroom for eight hours a day. I mean, the kids, don't you want to maybe teach them outdoors? You know, mm -hmm. Kind of, oh. I don't know. I, I feel like well, you're just raising yeah. zombies. Well, I think, again, you bring up another good point. I think in a, in a more controlled environment, in a more controlled educational system, 
we don't necessarily make room for our diversity. Some people learn in a very different way. You know, they're not not smart, but they're not academic. They're not, I'm not, I'm not ever going to learn how to do physics. I don't have a math brain. I'm a right brain person. You know, I have a, a more artist, writing, creative nature. I was just born that way. Um, I can't I do physics either, so you're okay. I had to take calculus in high school, and I literally almost had a heart attack in that class. And fortunately, my father was a math genius, and I made it through. And I never took another math class again. You know, um, and some people's brains work like they're they they learn hands on. You know. Mm-hmm. They're very tactile. They're very, they invent, they create with their hands, whether it's, you know, more engineering or artistic or architectural or whatever. And so, yes, we need an educational system. And it's, again, it's the same thing that really honors diversity. And I think there's been some improvements in education since I was a kid. It was definitely definitely one size fits all when I was a kid. And there's a lot of adaptations that have been made. I heard recently, I heard from somebody that they now have different classes. Like I know when I was growing up, they had classes for kids like me, but I heard like now they do it. they have like actual dedicated programs. You can actually put your kids in to help them. And it, it's kind of amazing that a lot of these shifts just happen due to conversation, due yeah. to the start of no government, none of that. It's just people yeah. realizing we got to change our community because if we don't, we're not going to have, we're not going to have a future. Yeah. You know, you're so right. And I, I really feel like a lot of the change is going to be grassroots. It's going to come from the bottom up. It has to. And the more we heal ourselves as individuals, the more capable we're going to be to make those changes on a grassroots level. Um, Because we're going to, the more we heal ourselves, the more we have to offer other people in terms of creativity, ideas, collaboration, cooperation, and honoring of everyone's divergent gifts. Um, But one of the things I just want to add that I think is so needed in our school systems is is, um, human relations, starting at a very young age, that it's part of the school system, not not just that you address bullying, for instance, which of course that needs to be addressed, but start before that, you know, have it be part of the curriculum where someone who's trained in a, in a very, you know, um, on a, on a level for children has children sit in groups and share feelings and talk about their hopes and dreams and talk about what it's like in their families and, you know, what they hope want to be when they grow up and what do they do when their brother is mean to them? And how do they, how are their parents teaching them to act when, you know, when they're scared or angry or sad or lonely and and then if it points to problems in their family, have there be resources to go help families instead of just, you know, prosecute them or remove children, you know, like that this is built in from the ground up into our whole educational system that we're actually helping children become relational human beings, teaching nonviolent conflict resolution skills from elementary school up. People are so terrified of kids today of growing up in chaos. I, I've said this, and I'm a strong believer. Kids today save us. They are going to be the ones that will save the world. Because, right. you know, they, they're they growing up in a world where they get to see everything. You know, okay. the thing is, is that they're kids that they're going to say, no, mommy, that's not true. Mm-hmm. I hope so. I do. And I want there to be enough voices that they can hear that they will be able to have a divergent opinion if what they're being taught is hurtful and unkind and destructive. Absolutely. And and one of the reasons why I'm writing my book, America in Therapy, is I hope it will be read by young people. I want young people to inherit a world that is loving for them, that is supportive for them, and that is habitable for them on a physical level. 
you know, I, I really want young people to read what I'm talking about and hear what I'm saying, because they are the ones, they are the ones. And we need all the good role models of cooperation and love and um, honoring of each other that we can find. Yeah. One of the things I love about podcasts and, and so many of the podcasters that I've met is that, you know, you are a voice for all these different points of view. And we desperately need that. And it's accessible. And it's one of the wonderful um, contributions of technology and the internet and social media is that we can hear points of view that we might not be exposed to in our homes or in our schools. I, I, I will say this is that I created this environment out of an idea of why can't we just have a conversation? Yeah, that's exactly it. That's and it. you know what? That's what therapy is, is a conversation. And so, you know, my original title for my book was Out of the Office and Into the World, because that's what I want to see. I don't want therapy to be something that's just behind the closed doors of someone who can afford it. You know, I want the principles of what we do, which is having a constructive, open, compassionate um conversation with one another and really hearing each other. Yeah. Like for example, I mean, if you're somebody that you can't afford therapy, if you have a close friend, the thing is when you have close friends and you have an open connection, open relationship, and you talk, yeah. you're able to communicate about your feelings. Um, and in the end of the day, it it is all about getting out of the office and coming into the real world on um, it's a reality that we all play and it never pauses. Sometimes it does. Yeah. Yeah. So who are we and who are really, who are we for the, all the people that we run into, whether it's someone in the grocery store or our best friend or our lover or our children, um, who are we for them? That's what we have control over. And, and I we think do. People really want, they want to feel like they can make a difference and we can all make a difference. Yes. I, I, I have to say, Phyllis, this is, this has been absolutely incredible. Um, it's really great to, to bring people on like you, especially cause like, I don't really know this that much, but like um, psychotherapy therapy in itself, like the in-depthness of certain things and like the idea of dual therapy you know, the idea of where trauma and how it develops over time. It's just, it's fascinating. It really it is. is. It really is. And, and it brings so much compassion because we're such yes. complicated beings, you know, and our greatest, the greatest injuries that we perpetrate on one another come out of the injuries that we've sustained. And we can break that cycle as a society if we want to. And if yes. we know. Yeah. Uh, and Phyllis, if they, if anybody wants to find your book, um, if you have any socials or your website, where can they find you? Yeah. So my book isn't in print yet. Um, so I, I, what I, what the best thing to do is go on my website, which is my name, www.phyllislevitt.com. And it's spelled L E A V I T T. And you can just sign in on my homepage and I will keep you abreast of where the progress of my book is and when it will come out. And, and I, you know, I, I write blogs and I write newsletters and I really, you know, share some of the different concepts that I'm talking about and some of my experience um, on my website, on, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, and I, you know, try to, you know, just write pithy things that I think are meaningful and inspirational. So, you know, please uh, sign into my, on my website though, and um, give me your contact information and I will let you know as soon as my book is available. Very so. Very exciting. And again, uh, thank you so much for coming on. And for anybody out there that wants more of this, be sure to like and subscribe. You can always comment um, and always send us an email at lost in the groove. It's with three O's um, at gmail.com. Send us all the fun stuff. And uh, you can find us on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube at lost in the groove pod. Uh, with that, thank you so much for joining us. Bye, everybody.